Okay, welcome everybody. Welcome uh, and happy new year. Welcome to our uh, Reading Online Sport Economics Research Seminars. Um, this is our 39th in a time of COVID-19. This is um, a time once again of, of lockdown in many parts of the world, certainly many parts of Europe. Uh, and uh, as such, uh, things are uh, very much still uh, getting in the way of the normal way in which we would meet uh, and share our research. Um, but thankfully, uh, we're able to meet online, meet virtually, uh, as we've been doing since since last March. Uh, and so this is our 39th such meeting. Uh, and Georg Stadman of um, uh, of the Europa Universitat Verdrina uh, is presenting a, uh, a paper titled Fortnite, the business model pattern behind the scene. Georg, you have about 60 minutes in which to talk and there'll be Q&A uh, at the end. Uh, but for now, the uh, the virtual floor is yours. So please do take away your talk. Yeah, thank you very much. So um, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, today, I would like to talk about this Fortnite game and uh, the tremendous success um, of the, the Fortnite game. This uh, leads to the question, what is the business model pattern behind this model? Um, yeah, so um, I don't know whether it fits in the series because it's uh, on, uh, on sports, but uh, some people, they believe that eSports uh, is uh, sports. And uh, to some extent, uh, Fortnite has also established itself as an eSport title. So there is a loose connection um, uh, to the overall series, but uh, James told me that it would fit and therefore I believe and trust in him. So uh, let's give a short overview of what I would like to talk about. I would like to talk about the business pod metal model pattern behind the success of the Fortnite game. Um, I will present a theoretical framework where uh, we derive the conditions under which a freemium strategy is, prof uh, is um, uh, appropriate and most profitable. And uh, we will especially uh, analyze the in-game shop and um, analyze it from a market marketing perspective. So what is going on in this in-game shop of Fortnite and what is uh, like good features um, which leads to this kind of profitability and success of the Fortnite game. Uh, in, in this presentation, we'll fo also focus on the managerial implications. But first of all, I would like to talk about the game description. Uh, Fortnite is a so-called player versus player game where 100 participants compete online against each other. Uh, it's a survival-based game and the players, they are jumping out of a kind of plane and they use parachutes to land on one island. And then they are collecting weapons and other materials in order to eliminate each other. Um, after a few minutes, it's the case that a storm approaches and this shrinks the playable map so that the combat activities gets more and more intense. And the last man or woman standing on the island wins an epic victory. Um, this is like a, just a verbal description, but I also tried to find um, a short video sequence um, on YouTube so uh, that you are able to have a look and how this video game looks like. Uh, it's about uh, one to two minutes um, um, summary of what's going on in this game. Please have a look. A new mode to the game was released and this mode was standalone and was free to download called Battle Royale. This mode features a hundred players in a match where you can either play solo or in groups or up to four people and you now face off against other real people, utilizing your shooting and fort building skills to be the last one standing. As the match progresses, you must stay inside a giant circle that is slowly shrinking so that you can't just hide on the fringes and expect to win the game. Again, the Battle Royale mode is free to download and is available on PC, Xbox One, PlayStation 4, and is even available for free on iOS and soon Android devices and they connect to each other, so you might be on your phone playing against someone on their PS4. 
While it is free to download, there are optional things that you can buy with real world money, mostly including character models so that your character stands out, and emotes so that your character can dance or show off in the most interesting way. A lot of these dancing emotes are based on real life dances or viral phenomenons. More recently, we see an interesting collaboration with Marvel, as the villain Thanos appeared in Fortnite in a new mode to fight over the Infinity Gauntlet. This was a limited time mode, but an interesting experiment that will likely result in more crossovers in the future. Now let's zoom out. As of May 2018, there are about 45 million active. Yeah, so in this uh, short video sequence, you got an impression of how the game looks like. So it's not a very brutal killer game, but it's more like a comic. Um, how these uh, characters look like. It addresses more to kids, so it's not that violent compared to, let's say, CSGO, you, 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 um, the, the Counter-Strike game, for example. Uh, you'll never see blood in this game. And it's also the case that you are not killing your opponent, but it's uh, just the case that you are like despawning your opponent in case that the opponent gets too many hits. The Fortnite game was the most successful uh, game when it comes to revenues in 2018 and also in 2019. Uh, the, you can see here that Fortnite is on the top and the revenues were a, uh, equal to 2.4 billion US dollars. So uh, Fortnite was leading this table, so it seems to be the case that they did something very good. When we compare the free to play genre with the premium games where you have to pay upfront um, games, uh, 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 up, upfront fees, then it's a case that on average, the free to play games, they are able to make higher revenues compared to the premium games where you have to pay an, an upfront uh, a price in order to get the game. The free to uh, play game, the, the top 10 free to, free to play games, they are able to generate an average revenues of 1.3 billion, while the premium games are only able to get an average revenue of 0.5 billion. So this uh, freemium, this free to play uh, genre is much, much more successful uh, when it comes to revenues. And then, of course, the big question is how you, can you get generate uh, revenues when you give your game um, away free of charge? And there are several possibilities how you can earn uh, revenues in case that you give uh, the um, game uh, away free of charge. It was also mentioned in this videos. So in a first step, it is the case that you have to convert real money into so-called V-Bucks, virtual bucks. And then you can go shopping in the in-game shop and you can buy, for example, outfits, skins or gliders or special weapons. And um, uh, by um, offering this kind of stuff in the in-game shop, uh, the company uh, behind Fortnite, like Epic Games, was able to generate so many revenues. Uh, this kind of stuff, like these outfits, the gliders, and uh, the, the wraps for the weapons, they are just cosmetic items. So they do not grant any competitive advantage. It's just cosmetic items. It's just for the fun, and it does not increase your winning su success. So uh, that's also very important, like in other games, for example, in FIFA, it's a case when you buy additional packages, you can increase your gaming skills, but that's not the case in Fortnite. Uh, in their very um, important book, like Osterwalder Pigneur 2020, uh, Osterwalder and Pigneur, they describe three different pattern, how a company can make money, how a company can make revenues, despite the fact that the product is given away free of charge. 
Uh, these three patterns are called multi-sided platform. For example, one multiplied set platform is Google or Facebook, because uh, it's the case that here, on the one hand side, the private users are able to use Google or Facebook free of charge. And then uh, the company can cash in on the other hand side of the market uh, by uh, generating advertise advertisements and advertisement revenues. This is one uh, pattern where free as a business model can be profitable. The other uh, pattern is described as bite and hook. And here a prominent example is uh, the printer and the ink example or the razor and the blade example where the basic product like the printer or this razor stick uh, is uh, given away free of charge but then the companies are cashing in via the ink um, or the companies are cashing in via the blades and then the third um, business model where a freemium strategy can lead to revenues and profits. This is freemium. One very um, prominent example is um, Skype, where most of the users are using Skype free of charge, but some of the users, they are paying a man monthly free. Like for example, I have a subscription for Skype. I'm using the premium. A version of Skype because I also want to call landlines within Europe and therefore I pay uh, 10 euros a month in order to also call the landlines. So freemium is um, the strategy where the basic underlying product is free of charge and uh, then um, the company can cash in via these add-ons. When it comes to Fortnite, it's a case that freemium definitely plays a very important um, role because the basic product, the game, is um, given away free of charge and uh, the uh, company is cashing in via providing these additional skins, these cosmetic items in um, the uh, in-game shop. So in... Um, um, the theoretical model, which I will roll out uh, in a minute. Uh, we think about the optimal price, optimal price for the game and the optimal price for the skin. The idea is when the game is given away free of charge, then uh, the company is able to generate the biggest player base possible, like everybody is playing the game. So the lower the price of the game, the larger the player base, and the larger the play, play, uh, player base, then uh, the, the company can increase the price of the skin uh, because then we can, the company can cash in via selling the skins. Uh, let's have a look at the uh, equations. In the first equation, we have on the left-hand side of the equation, the quantity of the game sold. This uh, is equal to one minus the price of the game. And hence we have a negative relationship between the quantity of the game sold and the price. The market size is normalized to one. In the second equation, we have the quantity of the skin. Um, the quantity of the skin also depends on the market size one, but then also depends on this uh, interaction term I and the quantity of the games sold. And then, of course, also negatively on the price of the skin. Um, we have this uh, interaction term I, and uh, then the number of the uh, players which are like playing this game. This is an important factor um, uh, with respect to the quantity of the skins sold. So you can uh, interpret this uh, I variable also as a kind of conversion rate. Like how can we convert uh, the users which use like the basic um, uh, version of the game? How can we, the company, uh, convert uh, these uh, users into buyers of the skin? Uh, then we have the following profit function, like the revenues, they stem from selling uh, the game. They stem from selling the skin. 
then we have some variable cost of uh, selling the skins, some variable cost of creating the game, and then th some fixed cost. In our paper, we are assuming that the variable costs are equal to zero, because uh, here, when it comes to the skins, for example, uh, it's a case that, of course, you have some cost for programming the skin, but uh, afterwards, it's a virtual good, and therefore, variable costs are relatively low, and we set the, uh, the variable costs equal to zero. Uh, the fixed costs are definitely important. Uh, fixed costs are important for the size of the profit, but uh, the fixed cost will not uh, influence the optimal price for the skin or the optimal price for the gain. So uh, fixed costs are important for the size of the profit, the level of the profit, but they don't uh, influence the pricing. And uh, therefore, uh, subsequently, we set the following, the variable costs equal to zero, but also the fixed cost equal to zero. So we, that we start with this kind of profit function. Um, we are inserting here, or we are solving equation one and equation two for the prices, and then we are inserting um, equation one and equation two um, uh, instead of these prices in equation three, and we are setting the costs equal to zero. Uh, then uh, the profit function in equation four just depends on the two quantities, quantities of gains and the quantity of skins. And we can differentiate the profit function with respect to these two uh, variables. We get these two first order conditions. And then in a the first step, we are solving uh, the two first order conditions for the quantities and afterwards for the prices. And then we get uh, to uh, the optimal um, expressions for the two prices. We have here uh, the optimal price for the game and the optimal price for the skin. Afterwards, we thought that it makes uh, really sense to uh, create a graph. Like we have here a graph where we have the optimal price of the game and the optimal price of the skin on the vertical axis. And on the horizontal axis, we have the variable i, this uh, interaction term. And here we can see that the higher uh, the interaction term, the higher this conversion rate, uh, the higher the price of the skin, and the lower the price of the game. In case that this variable i, this uh, conversion variable, in case that this takes a value of one, then it makes sense to set the price of the game equal to zero. And hence, we are giving, the company is giving away the game free of charge, but the company is cashing in via the skin. The game is given away free of charge and uh, the company is generating revenue and profit via the skins. So this is like the theoretical model, which is um, um, outlined in our paper. Um, under some conditions, it makes sense. It makes sense to give away the basic product free of charge, and to cash in via um, the 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 skins. In the remaining part of my presentation, I would like to talk about the managerial implications. Uh, of our paper, and we want to describe seven managerial implications. And the first managerial implications is that it makes sense to use uh, the own virtual currency. So the V-Bucks uh, is a virtual currency in the Fortnite game, and it really makes sense to use this kind of uh, currency. Um, we have already seen uh, some uh, the the um, information about these virtual currencies. So 1,000 V bucks are sold for uh, about 10 euros. Uh, there are also some other packages, larger packages for these V bucks. 
But then when you go shopping in the online shop, it's a case that no product is sold for 1000 V-Bucks. It's a case that uh, the price of the skin is equal to 800, 1200, 1500 or 2000 V-Bucks. So that it's always the case that there is some leftovers, like you, you are exchanging 10 euros in 1000 V-Bucks. You are, for example, buying the um, the skin of uh, which has the lowest price of 800 V-Bucks. But then you, you, you still have 200 V-Bucks over on your account. And then the, there seems to be some pressure um, uh, to buy more V-Bucks because it's a case that you can't buy anything for 200 V-Bucks. There is always something on your account and um, um, therefore there's incentive to buy some more V-Bucks in order uh, to buy some additional items. The second uh, managerial implications is that the customer has to make a decision in V-Bucks and not in euros or in US dollar. And uh, since there is an exchange rate between the virtual currency and the real currency, uh, the gamers might have some kind of money illusion. So the uh, gamers are not experienced in this currency V-Bucks, and therefore they don't know whether one good is expensive or not. So they lose the cr control they, uh, and they don't have this feeling about whether one good is expensive or not. And uh, in order to create this money illusion, it's very important to set the exchange rate above pari, which is a case in the Fortnite game. There, the implicit exchange rate for the smallest package is like one euro is equal to 100 V-Bucks. The exchange rate is set above pari. And uh, we also analyzed some other games, like we analyzed all the 10 games on this free to play list. And uh, all these 10 games, they have their own virtual currency and the exchange rate is always set above pari. So it seems to be the case that it's a kind of industry standard that um, the industry tries to create money illusion and uh, the exchange rate is always set above pari. Um, the third uh, managerial implication is that it makes sense to perform price differentiation. Uh, we can see here uh, price differentiation in this form that when you buy a larger package, uh, you get a kind of bonus or a price discount. Bonus or price discount leads us to our fourth insights that framing is very important. Uh, please have a look at this uh, example, uh, the fuel efficiency of a car. Um, let's assume that you have an old old car and now you are looking for a new car and car number one is advertised as follows. It needs 50% less fuel compared to the existing car. And car number, number two is advertised as follows. It can drive 50% more miles per gallon compared to an, an, an existing car. So when you really take a few seconds and you look at these two cars, um, and you are to some extent experienced in these kind of framing decisions, then it should be obvious that car number one has um, like better characteristics compared to car number two. But uh, this is not that obvious to normal people which are have to make a decision between these two cars and in some uh, like lab, uh, lab experiments, it's the case that people, to a very large extent, they opt for car number two. Uh, so framing is very important. And when it comes to um, um, here uh, price differentiation, uh, the company can frame this kind of decisions in form of a bonus or in form of a discount. Let's be more precise. Um, 
when we compare the smallest package with the largest package, then it is the case that the price of the largest package is like 100 euros. But you would also get the same amount of uh, V-Bucks in case that you would buy 13.5 uh, times the smallest package. And uh, in case that you would invest like 100 34.87 uh, euros. So um, uh, the price of this largest uh, package compared to 13.5 times the smallest package is only 74%. So the discount is 26%. But here uh, the company is uh, using like uh, the, the, the framing of the bonus because the bonus is 35% and the bonus is higher than the discount. This is also something which we de detected when we looked into the um, um, online shop that uh, the Fortnite company or Epic is using the bonus instead of the discount. Like the, there's a long, very long marketing literature, whether it's better to um, um, advertise with the discount or with the bonus. Like uh, when you when you really look into this um, literature, then of course it's always the case that each and everything is context dependent. So it depends on whether um, you talk about food or technical stuff. And when it comes to food, then it depends on whether you talk about junk food or about healthy food. Uh, there are different um, um, empirical evidence with respect to this question, is it better, better to uh, opt for the bonus or the discount? But here, like the Fortnite or the Epic company, uh, they opted for the higher number, which is the bonus. Then uh, what is also very important is to perform a horizontal or vertical product differentiation. Um, in the left part, we can see some uh, like different uh, skins, like different uniforms or different avatars. And these avatars are all sold for 800 V-Bucks. In the lower part, we can see uh, some um, uniforms or skins where we have a low degree of product differentiation. So more or less, it is like really the skin of the avatar, which is differentiated like white skin, black hair, white skin, uh, blonde hair, or like a uh, black skin. And in the upper part, we have a higher degree of product differentiation. Uh, we have uh, females, males, and also like fantasy figures. In the right part of uh, the um, graph, we can see also product differentiation, but these skins are also sold in different price categories. So skins are sold in uh, these four different price categories, like 800, 1,200, 1,500, or 2,000 V-Bucks. And uh, you can once more see like, like male um, skins, uh, female skins, and uh, fantasy skins, it's very easy to change the character. Like you just have to go into the dressing room and it takes like a few seconds to change the skin. And then you can act as a different avatar. Uh, what is also important and we can see it uh, several times is that the company tries to create time pressure. Let's go back to a different um, a uh, graph which I showed to you already a few minutes ago. Um, like here, I was uh, showing you the screenshot of the in-game shop. And it was the case that uh, um, we have some items which are only sold like for one day. Uh, like here, you can see the clock that in case that you are interested in this or that offer, you have to hurry up because this is only available for 15 hours. And then you can imagine that when uh, some of uh, when some friends of your kids already bought this kind of outfit and uh, there is a social pressure among the kids that they the, the kids really try to lobby at the parents. 
uh, that this uh, item is only available for the next 15 hours. We have to hurry up and buy this item right now because we don't know when this item will be available again. So it might be the case that uh, one skin is only available on a very special day and then we don't know when this offer will be available again. Furthermore, it's also the, the case that uh, Epic and Fortnite, they are creating exclusive bundles which are only available for a certain period of time. So for example, when there is Oktoberfest uh, in Munich, then it was a case that Ludwig and Heidi were offered and this was only uh, offered uh, during this uh, time period of the Oktoberfest and then this offer was abolished. So uh, time pressure uh, is of course in this um, um, in-game shop also, also a very important um, um, tool which is used in order um, to increase the revenues within the in-game shop. Then um, the Epic company is also organizing their own esports activities. So this is not uh, industry standard that the um, developer of a video game is also creating like these esports activities. For example, when it comes to Counter-Strike, it's a case that uh, ESL is one organizer of uh, these kind of esports activities and they are organizing these uh, very huge um, um, competitions and tournaments. Um, it is like a, a, a company which is independent of the game developer. But uh, when it comes to Fortnite, it is the case that uh, the Epic company, the game publisher itself, tried to establish uh, Fortnite as a esport genre. They created one tournament which uh, with the largest money pool in history. It was 100 million US dollar for the 2019 World Cup. And there it was a case that very young players participated in this competition. And some of these players were like between 14 and 16, which won this kind of competition. So they turned uh, millionaires over one weekend. And this was also like a very uh, important uh, marketing tool for Epic because each and every newspaper in the world, for example, the Financial Times reported about these very young millionaires, this very young gamers or esports athletes, uh, which became millionaires like over the weekend. And this was a very, very important marketing tool uh, in order to, um, yeah, on the one hand side, convince the young player base uh, to uh, stick to this uh, esport title, but also uh, to, um, um, yeah, ge generate um, this kind of uh, awareness in the in the press uh, on a on a global scale. So this was very good invested uh, marketing money. Um, so I was uh, talking about these uh, seven managerial implications. So um, use your own virtual currency in order to create money illusion, uh, perform price differentiation, uh, sell the different items, um, yeah, like uh, with, with a price discount or with a bonus. It's also the kind, of, uh, the case that um, um, this uh, marketing tool like advertising with bonus and or with a discount is used in the in-game shop. We also talked about product differentiation. Uh, this uh, seems to be important to, um, yeah, increase the attractiveness of um, uh, playing this game. When you always have to run around with the same avatar, it can be it can become uh, boring. 
and in order to increase like the the flow within the game and the interest uh, within the game it's always the case that new characters are invented i think overall like over the whole time period where fortnite exists from 2017 onwards it's a case that more than 750 avatars were created uh, time pressure is also a very important um, uh, tool which is used in the in-game shop, shop in several directions. And the last uh, um, a managerial implication was that the game developer also organized the eSport activities by themselves. We started uh, this uh, talk by looking at the theoretical model. We looked at the freemium strategy or we, we, we looked at the free as a business model pattern. We talked about the three um, patterns where this played a role. In the Fortnite um, business model, uh, it's a case that freemium is very important because the game is given away free of charge and um, the company cashes in via selling the skins. But also the multi-sided platform is important because a lot of other companies, for example, the Marvel company, uh, very uh, well-known music companies, they are using this very huge player base in order to uh, create uh, virtual concerts in this uh, Fortnite, on this Fortnite island. And uh, also the multi-sided platform plays a role in the tremendous success uh, of this Fortnite game. But this is also the end of my presentation. I hope uh, that you found it to some extent interesting. Um, I'm ready to start the discussion and I hope uh, that uh, we were able to launch uh, an epic victory uh, during this presentation. Thank you very much. I'm uh, open for your questions and the discussions. Thank you. Thanks, Georg. Really interesting talk, uh, and as 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 you uh, as you mentioned, um, <clears throat> very much fitting in with the series. I think esports uh, are sports, surely. Uh, so I don't think there's any any concern there. Um, so the first thing to say, um, actually, well, the first thing I might say is if you unshare your screen, Georg, because right now I've got a very big picture of me. Ah, uh, okay. Of I'll me. try to do that. Yeah, that's the button. Thailand band and. Very good. Perfect. Yes. Thanks a lot. Perfect. Great. Uh, and so, in which case, uh, are there any questions? No one wrote anything in the chat window. Um, and so, if you do want to ask a question, you can feel free to raise your hand to ask it, or just simply uh, uh, ask away. Victor, you've raised your hand, so please ask your question. Hi. Hey. Uh, good morning here in the US. Uh, first time that I actually asking a question here, so I'm a little nervous. Not gonna lie. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for the presentation. It was really interesting. Uh, I've actually been looking for for some researches in the area of esports. Uh, so this was really, really good for me to see that there is something being done on the fields. Uh, I do have a question regarding the marketing parts. You did say about the collaborations that Fortnite makes with Marvel, for example. Did you do any analysis of partners partnerships with the streamers, for example, or just, you know, streaming activity? Like if the if a higher number of the most popular streamers, and I can think off the top of my head, Ninja, playing Fortnite actively can actually impact people on spending more as well. Um, yes, um, like uh, we we did not uh, examine it. Uh, we are aware of the fact that um, yeah, playing is is important on the one hand side but the, that the kids are also spending a tremendous amount of time in watching these kind of games or like uh, esports activities. Um, so um, we, we did not uh, do any research on that. Of course, these kind of players are important multipliers for the company. When they have a special character, for example, um, this could lead to a situation where like, a, like a lot of viewers want to have the same character, like the same avatar. But there you would need access to data uh, from the company to, to, to check 
what happens if you give away one avatar to Ninja? He's playing a tournament with this avatar or he's uh, streaming something in Twitch with this avatar and how the sales figures increase. Um, the company can do that kind of stuff, but we have no, no not contact, no contact to the company. Does that answer your question or? Yeah, yeah it does. Okay. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Victor. Uh, thank you for asking questions. Uh, everyone's always uh, welcome to do so. Uh, and uh, so anybody, uh, any more questions or comments that people have? Ian Gregory Smith. Hi, I was just wondering uh, from if you thought about from a sort of policy perspective, because this sounds like pure evil when the uh, company is like fleecing these poor children who are spending all their pocket money on these uh, on these skins. And uh, and yeah, I mean, they, they have a monopoly once they've got you, they've got you right. So and have regulators thought about uh, trying to you know, make these regulate regulate these prices at all, so that uh, players don't get screwed. It sounds um, like they're using every trick in the book <laughs> that a monopolist <laughs> would to uh, extract rent from uh, the consumer base. Um. Yeah, like I, I, I really think that that you are right. They're using uh, every trick of the book. Therefore, I I think that. Our paper could be interesting for like bachelor students or master students who who are taught in marketing. But uh, about the regulator, I don't know. There are there are some associations which are, um, are of course treating uh, kids or but also adults and uh, professional football players for Fortnite addiction. So this is a very important topic: uh, addiction to video games. And there, there's a bunch of literature which is uh, dealing with this problem, but also this social comparison within the, the 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 world. This becomes very very important because when we both would um, play this game, I could observe what kind of cloth cloth you are um, wearing, and when you only have the default uh, cloth, which is free of charge. Like kids are blaming each other. Hey, you don't have money to buy a very imp uh, important skin. So uh, I can remember one kid saying, when you play the default skin, you are treated as trash. And uh, kids are comparing each other now in the virtual world. Like pr when, when I was young, we were, we were checking what kind of shoes do you have? Is it Adidas or is it one, one stripe too much? But here, kids are starting these kind of comparisons in the virtual world. Yeah, and yeah, and and there are like kids organizations which are like highlighting it, and they are trying to, yeah, do something about it. Let's say it that way. So I think there was uh, some efforts to um, regulate like in-play gambling with uh, play money, right? Uh, I can't remember exactly, but it seems to me that uh, yeah. Like if I was in the Competition Markets Authority, I want to be looking at this. Um. Uh, yeah, like you, you are. I think you are talking about so-called loot boxes. Yeah, yeah, where you can buy a kind of lottery ticket, and with a very low chance, you get a very um, expensive and rare weapon, for example. And uh, these loot boxes uh, were very. Um, in fashion, I think in 2016, 2017, and there the regulators started to look into it because it's a kind of gamble. You you have a lottery ticket, and with a low chance, you can you can get a very important item or a very important weapon. And uh, the um, game developers are not so much into these uh, loot boxes anymore. Um, this this I, I think this uh, kind of stuff is is gone. And there, the regulator like did something. Yes. Okay. Well, Thanks, yeah. I'd encourage them to look at monopoly pricing as well, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's 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 a, that's a, the question. Yeah, like monopoly. Like we we have uh, like ten games on the list. There are so many different video games on the on the list. But of course, 
uh, during a time period of uh, three years. It's a case that everybody focused on Fortnite. And now in, in 2020, uh, I just re received uh, the numbers like a, a few days ago about 2020. Their Fortnite is not on number one anymore and Fortnite dropped out of the top 10 list. So um, yeah, th there are some titles, for example, Candy Crush Saga, which are still on the list, making a lot of money with uh, that kind of stuff. But uh, Fortnite dropped out of the list. So for a, a time period, of course, it's a kind of monopoly. Yes, but um, uh, only for this very specific game. Like there are alternatives out there. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks, Ian. Uh, I'm kind of inspired by uh, your background there, Ian, with the Settlers of Catan board game. We've had the first esports presentation today, so hopefully at some point we can have the first board game related economics of sport uh, talk at some point. Um, whilst uh, Ian was Ian and uh, Georg were chatting, there was a bit of uh, hand up, hand down action. I don't know if that was teams uh, playing up, but Tunde, I don't know if you actually had a question. Your hand was up, but now it's not. Yeah, I, my hand was up, um, but I think um, the, um, the, the question has been addressed really with uh, the, the notion of loot uh, boxes. Uh, but I, I know the UK government is looking at areas of this in the new gambling review, which is, I think, is going to be taking place soon. But so that was just a, a point of information worth noting. Great, thanks, Tunde. No, thanks, thanks very much. No, thank you, thank you. Uh, and then Karina uh, had a hand up briefly. Did you have a question? Uh, hi, thank you. No, I didn't uh, actually have a question. I just wanted to say the same thing about the loot boxes that they are regulated in the UK at the moment. The legislation should be out in the in a few months. And uh, yeah, I think many games uh, still use loot boxes as a mean of um, in-game uh, monetization. And uh, yeah, it's definitely a um, controversy in, uh, in this market. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? Ah, Stefan. Morning. Um... So I have a sort of a, a broader question here, which is um, if you think of other, I mean, the, all these esports are very new, and um, so most sports are very old. But most sports in their very early stages go through this phase where initially everyone's an amateur; they're just playing for fun, and then professionalism emerges and it happens quickly or slowly different processes in different sports and i wonder do we have do we know anything about the the sort of the the, the evolution of professionalism in esports and you know where we are on that and you know any any insights into into that kind of that kind of idea um Like, um, uh, no, <laughs> I, I think it's a nice comment, Stefan. And um, that's an area we could look into. Um, I was just looking like, uh, uh, like a few days ago, we were talking about uh, Counter-Strike. And we looked at one paper from Dennis Coates, um, which was on whether um, it's good to have a more diverse team, like from different countries, different languages, or whether it's not good to um, have this diversity within this team of five players. And uh, he was looking at data from 2013 to 2017, I guess. And uh, the, 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 they were looking at price money. And the range, maximum and minimum, was between $100 and um, I don't uh, and uh, eight hundred thousand dollars, but for the team. So eight hundred thousand dollars for the team of uh, uh, on average uh, ten players, that was eighty thousand dollars per year in the year two thousand and thirteen to two thousand and seventeen. 
And uh, the average for the whole team was $30,000 for the team of 10. And uh, then we looked at the current numbers and uh, there it was a case that the best players were, were definitely able to earn like a few millions within the last year in Counter-Strike. So uh, due to the fact that the prize money really explodes, this of course is a driver of the, of the pro uh, professionalization of, of, the, of, the, of the teams. Um, uh, I think that right now we are, we are just in the early stage uh, of that. Um, uh, be because of the fact that uh, like um, five years ago, the average player was not able to live on, on, on this kind of money. So we can't talk about profit, um, yeah, pure uh, profits here. Um, I'm aware of some academies, for example, in Denmark, they, they have uh, special schools. So after you finish middle school, you can take one year off and for example, go to a boarding school and specialize in football, theater, and so on. But now they also have their lines in esports where they really try to become better and better and better in these uh, esport titles. And it's not about like uh, eating chips and, and drinking Coke for one year, but they really have uh, professional coaches and they, they have the right equipment in the school to get better and better. And so uh, it is the case that young people of the age of 16, they take one year off in these boarding schools in order to become like better and better in esports. And this is um, a very special phenomenon in Denmark where they have the setup that they have a gap year at the age of 16 and some use it to play um, esports, yes. But do, do, do you have ideas about this, um, how to analyze it? Um, well, not probably not very good ones, but um, the one there must be data on who are the most successful players. I mean, so we'd really like to know how much money everybody makes, but that's probably quite hard to figure out. Although you, the prize money is one part of it, but there presumably there's other ways of generating money from being successful. There must be endorsements and sponsorships now for the most successful players. But there must be there must be some some way of using um, you know Twitter or other social media to identify who are the most frequently referenced players and then to draw up some kind of of ranking and and then then you'd have a database of names and then you could start to think about well who won prior out of those names of databases we should be able to. Add, add, aggregate all of the prize money that's been paid out and so we could at least sort of get some sense of ranking of players and prize money and so forth so maybe that's one way that this could go okay um yes like like uh, esports or like this gaming is monitored very very well uh, for example there is one uh, web page which is called fortnite tracker and they are tracking each and every game, each and every player. So also the, they are tracking me and I really suck, like I, I, I can't play. And um, you, you can see statistics such as like kill death ratios and how many uh, uh, games you have won in each season, like over time and how you progress and so on. This is tracked for each and every player, like for there are, I don't know how many players are out there, 50 million in the world. And this kind of data is available for like Fortnite, uh, definitely. Uh, and also for Counter-Strike, there are, there are very, very good databases in how the, um, how the um, games are played and all the statistics are there. Yeah, well, that's probably, yeah, there's probably a lot of potential in that, I would have thought. Um, Thanks, Stefan. We've got a question from well, Karina has her hand up. Well, thank you. I don't have a question, just a comment related to this because I'm actually doing research on esports as well and I looked into this before. Uh, there is a website called esportsearnings.com which actually has all of this data on players, tournaments, teams with uh, dollar amounts for uh, how much everyone has, has earned. 
I don't know how reliable it is for like academic research purposes, but it is, uh, you know, useful to to look at. Um, yeah, p perhaps you can write it once more into the chat, like um, um, that, like Dennis Coates was using it for for this uh, Counter Strike paper, like the the database you you just mentioned, and uh, it's reliable and um, people are using it in academia. Yes. OK, that's good to know. Thanks. Great, thanks, Karina. And then Enya has her hand up. Yes, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask, I'm not so familiar with Fortnite tournaments, but are there like any superstar players or teams? Since in other esports, there are some very prevalent teams, for example, for League, it's T1, who are like national heroes in South Korea. But I don't know, are there any teams in Fortnite too that have this level of popularity? Because this would certainly affect their incomes, like T1 has huge sponsorship deals, for example. Um, uh, y yes, like there are some uh, famous players. For example, one of the colleagues just mentioned Ninja. Like he's, uh, I don't know, 20, 22 years old, uh, 20, 22 years old, like has blue, he blue hairs blue colored hairs and he's making like five hundred thousand dollars like a month for just streaming his um, Fortnite uh, uh, place on on Twitch. So this uh, video which I just showed to you like a short video se sequence. Um, uh, there in the second part it is also mentioned like the the very famous players and how they make money on Twitch by just playing and uh, um, millions of uh, uh, people are watching them playing. But would Ninja qualify as a professional player? So the differentiation is quite difficult, I guess, because he's more a streamer. So he's more an entertainer who happens to mainly play Fortnite. But is this categorized as a professional esports player? Or are professional esports players only those who compete in in these tournaments? No, Ninja is a professional player. Like like he was very good in these tourna tournaments, and therefore he he is able to use this popularity also on Twitch. This ah, is okay. how I would uh, describe it. Okay. Yeah, maybe it would be interesting. So in other sports, there is this this superstar effect. So maybe something similar is present for for Fortnite. I don't know. Maybe it's okay. It's yes. Experience. Okay. Great. Thanks, Enya. Uh, any more questions and comments? One thing that you mentioned of Dennis Coates made me think of Jörg uh, was that. Uh, it's very much esports is part of the uh, the the, uh, the literature because the uh, the 2019 Hihon Sport Economics uh, Conference was on uh, esports and new competitions, and Dennis presented, I guess, that paper. Uh, then uh, I've I've still got the program, so I'll pass that on to you. Uh, if there are any other talks there that are potentially of interest to you. Yeah, yeah, like um, I, th I have it here, like uh, it's okay. called okay. Uh, Applied Economics or it's published in Applied Economics and the title was like, is diversity good or bad evidence from esports teams analyzes. And uh, published in 2018. Looks like it was different then because uh, then it's presented video games and unemployment and gamers, noobs as workers. Uh, back in Hihon, but I'll send the program to you because it might be that okay. that's, that's yeah. interesting. Okay. Any more questions or comments? Well, thank you very much, Georg. Uh, was a really interesting talk. Uh, I don't think I've got to hand, I'm just going to check on my computer. No, I don't have to hand the poster for next week's talk. Um, but uh, next week, on January the 15th, we have Mario Lackner, 
of the Johannes Kepler University in uh, Linz, presenting Do Male Managers Increase Risk Taking of Female Teams? Evidence from the NCAA. Uh, so please do uh, join us again next week. Uh, but for this week, thank you very much, Georg, for a really interesting talk. Thank you, uh, everybody, for participating. Uh, very interesting discussion as well. Uh, uh, Happy New Year again. Uh, please do stay safe. Uh, wherever you are at the moment. See you all next week. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.